my name is Emma and the reading today comes from John chapter 8 verses 1 to 11 and I'll be reading from the NIV translation. Then they all went home but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts where all the people gathered round him and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away, one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. So just before Raynaud comes to speak to us, why don't we just pray over him? So yeah, God, we just really want to thank you for Raynaud today. Thank you for the words that you have placed on his heart to share with us today. I pray that he will know you with him as he comes to speak to us this morning. And I pray that each and every one of us will be able to encounter you afresh in our homes. Amen. Over to you, Raynaud. Well, thank you very much, Emma. Um, and what a wonderful prayer that I receive with, with an open heart. You might have noticed that um, a minute of silence wasn't exactly at 11 o'clock, but you are more than welcome to press pause at 11, step out, observe the moment of silence and get back in um, to what I truly believe today. God wants to set you up um, and help you uh, have a right frame of mind when we look at how Jesus deals with sin. Now, uh, you've, in all the uh, really good segments of from J um, the Charles to, to Stuart and, and the amazing worship, we've, we've heard the story of, of John 8, um, where the woman caught in the act of adultery is brought before Jesus. Um, and this forms the basis of the conversation that we need to have today about how Jesus goes about dealing with sin. Now, just to say, um, sin is quite an abstract concept, and I know I might be using words that, that might be foreign to your vocabulary or your understanding. So there, there are a few words that I, I think is important just to um, get right uh, on the same page in terms of how we define it and how we, uh, we talk about it when um, we use it. Now, the first one is the word um, righteousness. Righteousness um, would mean right standing with God. Um, and that is that will become important as we go on. The second word I actually want us to look at a bit is the word sin. Now, the word sin in the Greek word is amarateo. Um, and what this means is to properly miss the mark. Um, you see, the thing is, sin is such an abstract concept. And if we just talk about the word sin um, without really defining how we view it, uh, the conversation can get quite tricky. Now, just a bit of a roadmap um, for the conversation today um, in how we look at Jesus dealing with sin. I think there's, there's a few stops that I would want to make. The first one is looking at the various ways Jesus deals with sin and then how Jesus sets us up to succeed in this life. Now, that is a very narrow scope. Um, I really want to encourage you. Um, this, this sin part is actually a precursor to the message Ian gave on dealing um, how Jesus dealt with our history or deals with our history um, by setting us free. Sin is going to help us uh, as a springboard into that. So if you've missed that talk, I would really encourage you, go back um, and look at it again, listen to it, and really, really soak that in. I want to start us off um, with this uh, by reading Romans 6.23 from the Amplified Version. And sin can be quite a heavy topic, um, but I truly believe God wants to set us up today with the right frame of mind to approach it. Romans 6.23 says the following. It says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God 
that is, his remarkable, overwhelming gift of grace to believers is, the, um, is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So one thing we really need to take note of here, and I think it's, it's really important for us in our day and age, is that Jesus and God, God the Holy Spirit, is quite serious about sin. It's quite serious when we miss the mark. Um, you know, the... Uh, those things uh, Heidi um, and the family refer to in our kids' segment. Um, he takes it seriously. Um, the second thing I want us to just take note of this is that, you know, when Jesus engaged the, the women in adultery, uh, the religious leaders, us as individuals, he came out of a frame of mind that he's able to pay the price. Oh, that's, that is really, really significant. If I had to take you out to dinner, um, I wouldn't have a lot of confidence to tell you, you know, order what you want, because I didn't know who was picking up the tab. I didn't know who was paying the bill. But if I knew that I had the means to pay the bill, to pay everyone's meal, the way I interacted with fellow guests, friends, would be totally different. Because I knew that um, their sin or their tab, I was able to pay. Okay, and that sets us up for the first way. There's the two ways Jesus dealt with sin. Um, let me show you that. The first one is Jesus uh, dealt with the sin of humanity. The second way Jesus deals with sin is Jesus modeled how a child of God deals with sin. All right? So in the first instance, um, that is where that word righteousness comes in, where Jesus dealt with the sin of the world. Um, why did he have to do that? It's because we um, weren't in right standing with God. We were missing the mark on what it means or what it meant to be children of God, called the people of God. And that's the bill Jesus came to pay, and he paid that to the fullest extent. That's what the communion just reminded us of. You know, in Jesus' interactions, he knew that um, he's, he would have to pay the price because the Father really sees the fullness or, or the devastation that sin can cause. But this is, this is where I want to just introduce a framework of how I think God views sin. Because we can so easily step into a trap um, and see God as this, this distant God, you know, that, that God of thunder and anger, and he, He's just there to murder and kill and destroy us, and He's never happy with us. And that's how He approaches us when, when He deals with sin. I don't think that is true. I want to introduce a frame, a way of thinking, of how I, I see God the Father deal with sin. And that the Father is the key to that. You see, as a father, I can have a very, very strong dislike and even hatred of actions that devastate, break down, or alienate my child from what I know I've called them to. As a loving father and as a loving mother, my deepest, deepest heart's desire is to see my child grow up to all what God has called him for. And if I, a mere mortal, know how to give good gifts, how much more not God the Father? You see, that's a, that's a more accurate representation when we, when we say... Um, you know, God takes sin seriously. He does, but he does it out of the heart of a father because he knows that the, that the wages of sin is death and slavery, bondage. Um, and I, I, would really, I would really encourage you to go read Romans 5 to 8 um, because that, that tells the story so well, it's, it's, and, 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 and clearly about that progression, about how a loving God and the Godhead, God the Father, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, out of love, 
said, okay, how do we restore, how do we redeem humanity to us? And that's the story of the cross. That is how Jesus dealt with the sin. And that is how, how Jesus took us from unrighteousness and brought us into righteousness. Listen to what Romans 8, 14 to 15 says. It says the following, all who are led by the Spirit of God, you see, um, are God's children. You didn't receive a spirit of slavery, did you? To go back again to that state of fear. But you received the spirit of sonship in whom we call out Abba Father. And it's in this, in that sonship, that I think it really sets us up in how uh, we should deal with sin. You see, the way Jesus dealt with sin uh, was a free gift. He took us and made us he took us into the, he brought us into the family of God. Now we cry out, our hearts cry out, Abba, Father, we are sons and daughters. And that gift, that gift of righteousness, of salvation, uh, where the blood of Christ cleansed us, that's not something we can work for. And, and that's a distinguishing factor. You see, the, the way that our sin is dealt with in us becoming righteous, about getting that identity of sons and daughters, that's not something we can work for. That's never been something we could work for. We've, Romans is so clear. We've fallen short of the glory of God, and that's why we need a Savior. That's what you, that's, I would love for you to hear that this morning. That's at the heart of the gospel. That's at the heart of Jesus' mission. That's to redeem us and to to. Take us out of that place of slavery and say, but you are, you are called sons and daughters of the living God. And that's the platform from which you'd go out into this world and you live out my truth. How you step into my presence. Why you worship me. Why I lay down my life for you. That's to bring us into that family of God. That's to set us up. That's to enable us to stand in righteousness. It started defining the target. You see, our target is sonship. So when we miss the target, we are missing what God has intended for us as children of God. And I just, right here, I just, I, 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 that, that, that picture I showed you, um, in that scripture, can we put that up of the sheep again? You know, um, you'll notice that the sheep is quite dirty. Um, because uh, the story surrounding that is, is that, you know, if a sheep plays in mud, he doesn't become something else. He doesn't turn into a pig. If a sheep plays in the pig pen, covered in mud and, and the filth of the pig pen, he doesn't all of a sudden become a pig. Um, he stays a sheep. Our identity doesn't change because we still struggle with sin in our lives. Our identity is fixed. The only thing that happens with the sheep in a pig pen, it becomes stinky and dirty. It, it reeks of the filth that it played in. And it starts distorting the beauty um, that that sheep is intended to be. You see, the, the work of Jesus accomplished on the cross was not for a dystopian future that bears no relevance for us today. On the contrary, his death announced the beginning of our sonship and his resurrection confirmed every word and promise spoken by Jesus. And that's the invitation over this series. I want to just take a moment and and if you may be at that place where you say, you know, I've, I've not even thought about um, responding to Jesus' call to become a son and daughter, to receive what he's done for me on the cross. I want you to respond to that invitation now. You know, Jesus, Jesus is there. He's ready. He's paid the price for your salvation, for your righteousness, for your right standing with God. We want to pray with you. If that is you today, we want to pray with you. We want to pray with you that you receive Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior over your life. You receive the finished work of Christ, uh, of what Christ did on the cross for you. So if that's you, why don't you press on the um, a prayer button and now our host teams are, are ready to pray with you. I'm just going to do a 
a quick short prayer. Father, first of all, I want to thank you, Lord. I want to thank you, Jesus, for being willing to go to the cross, to pay the ultimate price. Lay down your life, Lord, for each and every, every individual sin I've had in my life. Father, I thank you that as I receive that free gift, that free gift of grace, that mercy of how you dealt with my sin, Lord, and accept you as Lord and Savior over my life, Father. You call me a son. You call me a daughter. And from my innermost being, Lord, I can now proclaim, I am a child of God. Father, to those who respond to that, Lord, may they experience how the Spirit just breathes upon them and can, com can confirm their sonship. The Holy Spirit being that seal of redemption. And I thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. The second thing is, um, with most things, Jesus modeled how we should go about dealing with sin. So, similar to Jesus' walk, Jesus was a son of God. Um, and he is the son of God. Um, so, when we receive him, when we are in right standing with him, we become children of God. We become sons and daughters of living God. And therefore, the way Jesus responds to sin and deals with sin becomes our model of how we go about walking um, and dealing with sin. Now, I want to quickly take you back to um, John 8. John 8 is where this woman caught in adultery was brought to Jesus and she was put on public display. Um, and just to set the scene, uh, you know, when we read the Bible, I don't think we see some of the peripheral people. Um, the, the folk in and around Jesus, it, it wasn't only the, the, the woman caught in adultery and the, the scribes and the spiritual, le the religious leaders of that day. The disciples were also there. And I think there was a few curious onlookers um, around, you know, people who might have had faith or, you know, people who were just curious to see what Jesus is doing. And, and, and imagine this. This is, this is such a moment where a woman caught in adultery is put before God and especially the onlookers, the, you know, the disciples, the curious people go, okay, well, this is a real moment. This is a, a defining moment of how on a public platform Jesus goes, uh, you know, Jesus went about dealing with sin. See, nobody denied the fact that the woman was caught in adultery. Nobody denied that. But what people might have missed is the hypocrisy of the religious leaders. And this is where Jesus, oh, he's, he's always on point um, in the way that he responds. So John 6, 7, just to, to refresh your memory, is they, the religious leaders, said, um, said this to test him so that they could frame a charge against him. Jesus squatted down and wrote with his finger in the ground. And then he said, whichever of you is without sin should throw the first stone at her. You see, in this setting, Jesus is um, dealing with sin actually on multiple levels. He is actually dealing with the woman caught in adultery. He doesn't excuse her. He doesn't tell her to leave. But he also deals with the religious leaders, their hypocrisy, their, um, um, their schemes to, to, to catch him in a trap, you know, to, to really put him uh, and force his hand. So he, he deals with their hypocrisy. But I also think he deals with some of the peripheral folk around the table. And he deals with them in the sense that the way that he goes about dealing with the women caught in adultery will set them up to receive grace and mercy for their own sin in their own life. Um, so just one or two things um, I want to I wanna highlight from that is the first is Jesus knows what pleases the Father and the Holy Spirit, and he responds accordingly. Jesus knew in every moment what pleased the Father and the Holy Spirit and he responded accordingly. His heart was at the right place. The value that he put on um, God the Father's truth was accurate. And his response was in accordance with that. 
There was no dislocate between the two. And I think that's oftentimes where we stumble. Um, John 8, 28, 29, Jesus says this. So Jesus said to them, uh, when, you are lifted up, uh, when you've lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am the one, Savior, the Christ, and that I never act on my own initiative. Um, I say exactly what the Father taught me, and the one who sent me um, is with me. He hasn't left me alone because I always do what pleases him. Jesus models how we deal with sin. The first place to start is how do I deal with sin in my own life? I need to align my actions, my behaviors, the way I perceive truth to that what I know pleases God. You know, and it, it might sound really basic, but dealing with sin shouldn't be a complex formula or, you know, arithmetic or, or mathematical equation or see how far I can get close to the edge. Dealing with sin in my own life, to some extent, boils down to the fact to God, am I aligning my heart? Can I reflect the prayer of the psalmist in um, in Psalm 139, saying, God, search my heart. See if there's anything in there that shouldn't be in there. And remove it. And then work hard at, at aligning my actions and my heart. We only, we only find Jesus' yoke easy and his burden light if we accept his definition um, and interpretation of a subject as the final truth. I'm going to say that again. Jesus' yoke, the invitation to follow him, to walk, you know, to follow him, to receive him, to have that, that life um, of truth, that life that is um, not heavy burdened, is only light if you accept his definition and interpretation of uh, a subject or an object as final truth. That's so important for us to understand because the thing is, if I'm yoked with Jesus, I might not find the yoke very comfortable or light if I don't accept that what Jesus says is truth. Is truth. And what Jesus says is sin, where I'm missing the mark, is sin. And this is where the world um, and worldviews really start seeping in and where we need to grow in our second point. We need to grow in our understanding to discern between what is good and evil. You see, once again, Jesus, it was practiced. Um, it, 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 it became, uh, Jesus was on point with his discernment every single time. You can read a story, Jesus knows. He knows what's going on in the heart of people. Hebrews 5.14 says the following, um, and encourages us uh, as believers to mature people need solid food. And by mature, I mean people whose faculties have been trained to practice to distinguish good from evil. To distinguish good from evil. That's how we deal. Because you see, the thing is, um, as fellow Christians, we need to encourage one another to walk in the way of truth. But it's how we go about that. It's how we, in ourselves, are able to distinguish between what is good and what is bad. And that is the Christian mature walk. That is how we grow in our maturity and how we respond to um, sin, the sin of others, and sin within myself. Because if we can distinguish good from bad, our behavior that follows in the way that we engage other people caught in sin is different. As an immature believer... I can, I can honestly, and I say this with a lot of love and respect in my heart, I can cause more devastation of trying to sort out someone else's sin in their life because I go about, the, go about it the wrong way. I fail to mention that the reason why they need to address sin in their life is because there's a loving Father, there's a loving Savior, that they are children of God, that they are missing the fact that they have an identity of a royal priesthood, of an incorruptible seed. And that that sin is keeping them in slavery and in bondage. 
but the heart is to set free. And the way that I approach that is with a loving heart in presenting truth to them, not forcing it down their throat, not badgering them, not breaking them down, because then surely, am I not repeating, am I not, am I not missing the mark in my attempts to present someone with the truth? So it's so important, church, and especially in the, in the times that we live in, that for you as an individual, you need to see the way Jesus responds to the woman in adultery. He doesn't deny it. He always confronts with Christ and truth. And then he sets us up to succeed by empowering us with the Holy Spirit and saying to her, you know, has no one, is no one here left to condemn you? No, Lord. Go on and sin no more. Don't get caught in the, in the same pattern of life. Be set free. Because the invitation was to her. The invitation was also to the religious leaders. Hey, guys, if any of you have no sin, cast the first stone. Surely their sin was also put on public display, the same as the woman caught in adultery, but their response was different. The one walked away angry. The other, the other one, the, the, the woman caught in adultery stayed and received mercy, received that free gift that Jesus offers us. I oftentimes think an, an unwilling heart harms our relationship more than, our, than the mistakes that we make. Because an unwilling heart doesn't allow us to follow Christ. An unwilling heart seeks his own way, seeks its own truth. A willing heart submits. A willing heart receives. A willing heart hears. A willing heart starts echoing God the Father's heart to fellow believers. And I want to take a moment today. Um, Neil T. Anderson compiled the list um, where he's, he, he took out scripture of, of who we are in Christ. And I, I want to just take some time to read that over us today. If, if you've um, accepted Lord, uh, uh, Jesus is your Lord and Savior. And you've stepped into that sonship, that daughtership, becoming a child of God. This is, the pro this is the declaration that God makes over you. This is what he means with, if he's talking about the mark, about hitting the mark, not sinning. He's talking about this. He's talking about this list, which... Which I'll read for us in a which I'll read for us in a moment, and and just one thing I want to say about this um, about this. Remember, our sonship, our our adoption into God's family, it's not something that we can strive for. It's something that we were born into. A pig can't strive to become a sheep. It needs to be born a sheep. That's why the first step of salvation is so important. You see, because when we receive Christ's finished work on the cross, we die with Him and we are raised with Him. Our identity has changed. And we need to understand that, that when we, we don't become children of God by what we do, we are children of God because Jesus paid that price. He picked up the tab for the women in adultery, for the religious leaders, for the folks standing around in the peripheral, for all of us. And then he said, I'll pay that price. I'll deal with your sin so that you can step into righteousness as a child of God. So don't you just want to take a moment, quiet down, And while I read this list, please hear the proclamation is being made over you. 
I'm accepted. John 1, 12. I am a child of God. As a disciple, I'm a friend of Jesus. John 15, 15. I have been justified, declared righteous. Romans 5, 1. I am united with the Lord and I am one with Him in spirit. 1 Corinthians 6, 17. I have been bought with a price and I belong to God. 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. I'm a member of Christ's body. 1 Corinthians 12, 27. I've been chosen by God and adopted as His child. Ephesians 1, 3 to 8. I have been redeemed and forgiven of all my sins. Colossians 1, 13 to 14. I am complete in Christ. You are complete in Christ. Colossians 2, 9 to 10. I have direct access to the throne of grace through Jesus Christ. Hebrews 4, 14 to 16. I am secure. I'm free from condemnations. Romans 8, 1. I'm assured that God works for, all, um, for my good in all circumstances. Romans 8, uh, Romans 8 uh, 28. I am free from any condemnation brought against me, and I cannot be separated from the love of God. Romans 8, 31, 39. I have been established, anointed, and sealed by God. 2 Corinthians 1. Colossians 3. I am hidden with Christ in God. Philippians 4, 1, 6. I am confident that God will complete the good work He started in me. I am a citizen of heaven. I have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. I am born of God, and the evil one cannot touch me. Come on. This is who you are in Christ. This is, the, this is the proclamation that Jesus makes over you. You are significant. I am the branch of Jesus Christ, the true vine, and a channel of His life. John 15, 5. I have been chosen and appointed to bear fruit. John 15, 6. I am God's temple. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Um, I am a minister of reconciliation for God. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 to 21. I am seated with Jesus Christ in the heavenly realm. Ephesians 2, 6. I am God's workmanship. Ephesians 2, 12. Um, uh, 2 10. I, I may approach God with freedom and confidence. Ephesians 3 12. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Philippians 4 13. I can do all things to Christ who strengthens me. Jesus will repeatedly meet us amid our sin with undeserved mercy liberating truth and empowering grace. I'm going to say that again. Jesus will repeatedly meet us amid our sin with undeserving mercy, liberating truth and empowering grace. You can do all things to Christ Jesus who strengthens you. You can deal with the sin in your life. You can deal with the brokenness in your life. Why? Because Christ empowers us. And can I ask church, as a world, we need a church. We need believers. We need children of God to take up their identity and really run with it, really embrace it, really put a serious emphasis on it of who we are as children of God. It was important when Jesus walked the earth, it will be important until he returns. Christ's heart, the Father's heart for us as children is to walk in the fullness of His grace. Because it's in that invitation that Jesus says, come to me, all who are weary, all who are heavy burdened. Take my yoke upon you. And that's the invitation today. Let's pray. Father, thank you, Lord. Father, thank you for your father heart, for that, that, that heart that says, my heart breaks when my children are caught in bondage, in lies. 
Lord, and thank you. Thank you, Jesus, that you loved us enough to come down to earth to model what it means to be a son and daughter, but also to pick up the tab, to, to pay the price of sin in our lives. And then go further to not only pay the price, but to empower us by your Holy Spirit. Not leaving us as orphans, but leaving us as, as empowered sons and daughters, as, as a royal priesthood. To step into the fullness that you have for us. To, to, to encourage us to, that we can do everything, all things, all the truth that you have for us that is ours. That we can step into because you empower us with your Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit, thank you that you won't leave us nor forsake us, but you'll walk with us, helping us to search our hearts, guiding us into truth, guiding us, opening our hearts, that where Hebrews 5 speaks of helping us to the place of maturity, that we can distinguish between what is good and evil. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that that's what you help us do. Take us to that place of maturity so that we can embrace the fullness of that righteousness of God in our life. Father, and if there's anyone, um, any one of us watching today, it's saying, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worthy. Lord, may they, may they hear, Lord. May they experience that they are worthy. The price paid for them was as expensive as for any of us. The son, your son, on the cross. Most expensive price. Father, and may they receive that invitation. May they receive that invitation and that introduction to Jesus in receiving him. May we all, Father, I want to pray if there's sin keeping us bondage, Lord. May we bring it before you, Father. So that we are set free, Father. I want to I wanna pray against the spirit of fear, Lord. About declaring sin in our life, Father. The lie of the enemy that if you had to tell someone or if you had to you know, uh, put it before God that you had the sin in your life, you would be cast out, you would be pushed aside. Father, I want to pray against that in Jesus' name. Thank you that the woman caught in adultery gives us, shows us that when we bring our dirtiest, most disgusting lies and secrets to you, you will handle that with grace and truth. You'll show us mercy. You will pick us up and you will restore us. Thank you for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. We're just going to respond to a song about Jesus laying down his life. Um, and, and, and as we respond, think and pray um, and worship as a son and a daughter of the living God.